us through the dark, you're never changing. You heard your children, and you hear your children now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You answered prayers back then, and you will answer now. You are the same God, you are the same, you were providing them, you are providing now, you are the same God, you are the same God, you keep singing this out just our prayer this morning he's the same same God we know you free the captives then you're freeing hearts right now you are the same God you are the same God you touch the lepers then I feel your touch right now you are the same God, you are the same God. You're the same, you're the same, never change. We love you, God, we love you, God. Sing this together. I'm calling on the Holy Spirit. time together sing oh god my god oh god my god i need you oh god my god i need you every voice
We can go ahead and take a seat. Um, and as we continue through the service, um, kids that are in here right now from Kids of Grace, you are dismissed to head over to the COG building. If you'll see um, leaders back there in the right corner, you can go ahead and meet them and head over there. Um, and at this time, as our ushers get ready, I'd love to pray for us. Um, and you can see on the screen that there's three ways to give here. Giving is something we do each service, not just as a ploy. <laughs> It's not a business strategy. It's truly something we believe in that God has called us to do. You know, our staff that works here believes in this. Uh, we participate in this. Our pastor participates in this. And we just believe as a community when we can do something together that God has called us to do, that there is power in that. Amen? Um, so I'm going to say a prayer for us. And, and Father, thank you for today and thank you for the opportunity to be here to worship you. God, I pray, for, I pray for provision for those that need it, for healing for those that need it. God, we just sang that the same God that moved mountains, God, that, that led his son back home, that changes the seasons, that created the earth, that healed, that made miracles happen, the same God that we know and read about and have fallen in love with is the God that you are today. You haven't changed. So, Father, I pray that we would dig into you in this season. Thank you for who you are. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen.
a lie when the enemy tells us that God will let us down because he won't. Sing this out. You're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. so much for this morning, this opportunity to come and have the privilege to worship you. God, I pray this morning that just let this be an affirmation that you are good all the time, even if we don't feel like it, even if we have doubts, even if we have anxiety or depression or all the things that come along with this life. God, help us stand on the truth that you are good. You are full of goodness you are full of life, and you love us so much. We thank you for this time together. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We can go ahead and have a seat. This morning, we have the special privilege to hear from one of our own partners who we've heard from before. So, Linda, i love to invite you up. And uh, she has brought the word before, and it is always an incredible experience. So, thank you so much. Um, for being here and preparing while Rick is out of town on a much-needed vacation. Um, So I'm going to turn it over to Linda. Thank you, Jeff. Good morning, Grace. I'm so excited to be before you. Um, Like Jeff said, I've spoken before. It's been a couple of years now. I remember um, when Pastor Rick asked me to to, um, share on Mother's Day a couple of years ago, and um, I was like, no, he did not. <laughs> but he did, and, uh, and I accepted, and, and God was faithful and um, allowed me to share that message. But I remember afterwards going, don't ever ask me to share again. <laughs> and he was like, okay. Um, and it, it, I think it, it's been a couple of years, and I, it, God convicted me recently about it and was like, you know, that wasn't the right thing to say gotta love God for doing that. And so I sent him a message, I think at the beginning of June, and I was like, so I've been convicted, and I'm going to, (laughs) just wanted you to know, uh, God convicted me about saying that, and if you need another speaker at any time, let me know, and I'm I'm happy to share whatever God um, would put on your heart for me to share. And so um, he's like, great, how about in three weeks? And I was like, oh. But God is faithful, and, um, and so the last couple of weeks I've been um, studying and um, in his word to, to share this message today. So for those of you that don't know me, my name is Linda James. I'm married to Jacob and Tim, who had to um, wrangle our three, three boys this morning um, to get here on time. So um, I have uh, three young boys. I'm sure you've all met them at some point in time, uh, full of energy, 
keep us in your prayers. They eat like nobody's business, and um, they have tons of energy. So we're just we're struggling to keep up no matter what. Um, so today, this week, actually, not today, but happy Independence Day to all of you. Um, this um, July 4th uh, commemorates the Declaration of Independence, which was ratified by the Second Conti Continental Congress on July 4th, 1776, establishing the United States of America. And according to Wikipedia, um, it's funny to, say, to be able to say that now, as a geriatric millennial, we were told not to quote Wikipedia, and definitely not to write our papers based on what was on there. But Wikipedia is a credible source, as we've been saying for years. And so now, now I get to quote Wikipedia even in a sermon. Uh, so the Founding Fathers delegated the Second Continental Congress, um, declared the 13 colonies were no longer subject or subordinate to the monarch of Britain, King George the Third, and we were we were now united, free, and independent states. The Congress voted to approve the independence by passing the Lee Resolution on July 2nd and adopted the Declaration of Independence two days later on July 4th. Congress also debated and revised the, the declaration, um, mostly removing some of the comments that Jefferson put in where he was really vigorous about denunciating uh, King George III for importing um, the slave trade. And so finally, two days later, on July 4th, the Declaration of Independence was signed and passed. Um, a day earlier, John Adams um, decided to write his wife, Abigail, kind of jumped the gun. He was so excited about the Declaration of Independence. So he wrote his wife, Abigail, uh, a letter, and these words were in that letter. It said, the second day of July 1776, see, he jumped the gun, will be the most memorable epic in the history of America. I am apt to believe that th that will be celebrated by succeeding generations as the great anniversary festival. It ought to be commemorated as the day of deliverance by solemn acts of devotion to God Almighty. It ought to be solemnized with pomp and parade, with shows and games and sports and guns and bells and bonfires, uh, illuminations from one end of this continent to the other, from this time forevermore. John was very excited about the Declaration of Independence and he obviously jumping the gun and saying that it would be on July 2nd. Um, it is now July 4th. And John was right about how we would be celebrating this declaration. Today we, we see ourselves with fireworks and parades and barbecues and family reunions and picnics and all kinds of celebrations. One thing, however, um, that John could have could not have foreseen is that we would uh, basically decline significantly um, from the solemn acts of devotion to God Almighty for the freedom that we received from our oppressors. That is very much the case today. As Americans, we were to isolate, one, if we were to isolate one thing about America is our love of freedom. Um, we are known to be about known because of our freedom. That's one term that the world knows very well um, that is synonymous with America. That is our highest held and most praised of all blessing. That, um, that is our highest held and most praised blessing, and we do really enjoy that. Um, but we, and we thank God for that freedom that we have. But as a nation, um, our pursuit of freedom has also, hasn't just ended with our oppressors. We see today that our pursuit of freedom is looking very much like our pursuit of being free from God and his word. We are very much aware that the freedom that we enjoy in the day that, um, in the days that we live right now are terribly abused. We see it in the news. We see it uh, reflected and how our society um, is leaning towards um, more and more things that are destructive to our families, to ourselves, to our community. We see this through um, the high crime rates. We see this through alcohol and drug consumption. And we see this in the laws that we continue to pass that want to just broaden 
our opportunities to destroy ourselves. You know, we see it even in uh, more recently in the marijuana uh, being passed from state to state. Marijuana is has been taught, all of us had D.A.R.E. program, right? And they told us marijuana is a gateway drug. And now marijuana is just a, another source of revenue in this country that we want to, to, le to lean from. And so our freedom has taken us from where we used to just be oppressed by the British, but now we oppress our own selves in our own lives in every possible way. We also see this in our, our pursuit of the recent social movements. We see um, some of the push for you know, to the right to, to for abortion as part of women's rights. We see this as the push for parents not being able to decide what their kids can and cannot learn. We see this with the push for open media allowing uh, fornication and adultery to be glorified. We see uh, polluted relationships on TV and being encouraged in society. We see our, uh, our destruction to marriage and divorce is glorified. They do divorce parties now? That's a whole thing. <laughs> And in the name of freedom, many things go on that are terrifying abuses of our freedom, and it continues. And if it continues the way it is, we will lose our freedom. And it is a characteristic of man in a free society that he will abuse freedom. We, we live in a fallen state um, where man is sinful. Our sin nature um, leads us to, to a life of destruction. And now we hear that man, man is good. We hear this all the time. Human beings are basically good. We hear all these things, but the Bible tells us that man is not basically good. Jesus had said to the young ruler, the young rich ruler who asked him about, you know, what can I do to, to inherit the kingdom of God? And, and he said, good master. And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? He said, there's no one that's good except God. Man is not basically going to control his freedom. That freedom eventually leads him to destruction. It is and it will be abused by man. It is the nature of freedom that it can be abused at some point and to the point that they will lose it. So what is true in our political, in our um, environment, our sociological environment, our, our world today is also, is also true in the spiritual world. We're seeing... We see this constantly. You know, the Bible talks about in the last days. We are living in those last days. It said in Timothy and, and Isaiah, we see that, as well as Roman chapter 1, we see that um, in the last days that men shall be lovers of themselves. There would be covetous. There would be boasters and proud and blasphemers. There would be disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. There would be truce breakers. They can't keep a covenant. There'll be false accusers. They will indulge in themselves and be inhumane to others. They'll be despisers of all things that are good, traitors, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, and having a form of godliness but having no power. And that we should turn away from these things, as Timothy tells us. So today I want to focus on our freedom in Christ and some of the abuses that occur because of that freedom. I want to share with you today from Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapters 5 and 6. Paul, in this letter, really takes the time to warn the Galatians about not using their freedom as an opportunity to sin and to live unruly. So let me just take a moment. So Paul wrote this, this letter to the Galatians, the, the church of, in Galatia. And Galatia was um, an area in Turkey, in modern-day Turkey. And in that area, uh, they often worshipped um, a deity um, called Sybil. And she is uh, a goddess in that time. And um, the ancient, ancient people of Asia Minor, which is that Turkey area, um, they, they most celebrated um, some of the Greek riots and, and processions um, 
they show her as, you know, this exotic mystery goddess who, who arrives in a lion chariot um, accompanied with wild music and wine and disorderly behaviors and exotic following, ecstatic following um, throughout the, Asia, the region. And so some of the doctrines, which are some of the, um, the many philosophies uh, that, that followed that goddess, um, was about trying to maintain that a knowledge of God can be achieved through spiritual ecstasy, um, direct intuition, or special individual relations. Um, those were connected with that worship, and they were more readily led to believe that the full privileges of Christianity could only be attained through an elaborate system of um, ceremonial um, symbols. And so in this, the Galatians essentially um, believe that you can only know God through fleshly things. And so when Paul, this was his first missionary journey to, to Galatia, and so this is the first place that he arrived to, and he preached the gospel after being, after being saved. And Paul, so Paul came there, shared the gospel with, the, with those in Galatia, and established the church that is in Galatia. Um, so he writes this letter because after he's established his church and he's, he's had to go back to Jerusalem and other areas and, and spread the gospel, he hears that there are some things going on with this church. And so he writes them a letter. And so he writes them a letter um, because they have, he, Paul came and taught them about um, justification justification by faith. Um, basically that we, uh, we come to Christ alone through faith alone um, by gr through his grace and that no, there's no works or things that you can do to gain salvation. And so Paul taught them this and then here comes a group of individuals um, who decide that you know what, what you, what you received is not enough, actually. You need to take it back, and so you need to be circumcised. And these were Jews that wanted to teach them about circumcision and the law and saying that you cannot be saved by Christ alone. You have to also do these things. And so Paul writes them, and, you know, Paul is pretty upset. If you've read the other letters of Paul, whatever he's writing to the churches, he usually takes a moment and praises that church and says, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I thank God every time I think about you. I thank you. I thank God for your faith and what you're doing and how you're carrying forward in the ministry. You don't get any of that in Galatians. It's straight, like, <laughs> no, no chaser, right? It's straight liquor. And so he is like, what are you doing, basically, you know, and who, you know, what, who has bewitched you that you should believe this, this falsity? And so he, he writes to them because these false teachers are coming in and telling them, hey, you have to be circumcised in order to be saved. And so many of them were about to get ready uh, when this letter arrived. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. Um, not that circumcision is a bad thing, but believing that that is necessary for salvation is the issue. And so this is considered a heresy. And so Paul was so grieved with the Galatians when he, who he spent so much time laboring and teaching them the doctrines of Christ that, and, you know, that they were so easily persuaded to follow a doctrine that he had warned them about and said, oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? A doctrine that that never included them, because the, the Gentiles, the Galatians were Gentiles, they were never included as part of the Jewish doctrine. But here, here comes the, the, the individuals from the Jewish religion trying to tell them that they, they can ca um, have salvation through this way. And you can hear the pain and frustration of the Holy Spirit in, in Paul's writing. And I believe God is having the same pain and frustration today because he desires a church that is without spot, wrinkle, and blemish. I'm sorry, my voice is cracking. It's one of those days. Um, and he desires a church, a body of believers who follow his teaching, his doctrine, his way, the, the ways that he has laid out for us. So you see, God has established his own way and that we should follow it. So I just want to take some time and unpack um, what Paul shared with the Galatians in chapter 5 and 6. So we're going to read first um, Galatians 5, uh, verse 1 through 12. And if you have your Bible, you can take a moment to turn there. Um, if not, it's going to be up there. And I'm going to warn you, I am a King James Version reader. So 
we're going to take it back a little bit. Um, so Galatians 5.12, it says, stand, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty where Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever you are, are justified by the law. You are fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of the righteousness of faith, by faith. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision avails anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. You did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? This persuasion comes not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. I have confidence in you through the Lord Jesus that you will be none otherwise minded. But he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment whosoever he be. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross cease. I would, they, I would that they even were cut off that trouble you. So Paul writes to them and says, you know, if you believe in this fallacy of what these individuals are telling you, Christ will profit you nothing. So obviously in today's context, we're not being led by false prophets to circumcise our flesh. But we have false prophets and teachers today that are working day and night to convince the church to follow teachings that tell us that there are many ways to God, that tell us that God doesn't care about our sin and that we're all God's children, that we just need to love everyone and desire them to ch- and, and not desire them to change or to come to Christ that the Bible is just a book by men, and that culture has changed. Times have changed. The Bible is outdated. That the love of God, that love is God, and that we shouldn't be anything but nice, and so on and so on. If we believe these teachings, we we allow ourselves, just like the Galatians, to be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. These persuasions don't come from God. They come from individuals that want to persuade us away from God's word. God says that all have fallen short of the glory of God, that all have sinned, and that all are in need of salvation. Man is not inherently good. We have inherited the sin nature from Adam, from the fall. And so to to automatically consider that our hearts are pure, that our ways are right, is wrong. Otherwise, if we believe these things from the false prophets and the teachers of today, then we wouldn't need the gospel. We wouldn't need Jesus. We wouldn't need his life, death, or resurrection. It would all be in vain. But we know that that is not true. We know that God's word is true and that he said to let every man be a liar. As Paul said, let, us, let those who distort that twist and falsify, mislead, or even change the very form of the gospel. Let those people um, be worthy of a, of a curse. He said to let them be a curse, according to Galatians 8, 9. He said to don't even give them space to begin to teach you these things, to give you, to give you these ideas. Allow them to be a curse. And Jesus said that his sheep hears his voice and another they will not follow and we know we know that we need to know God's voice today we are hearing many voices all around us and even in the churches we're hearing many voices and so how do we get to know God's voice we got to get in his word we have to spend time in God's word and we need to be led by his spirit God's word is truth And it is not something that changes with culture or time. It is objective truth. It's not subjective. And so having fellowship and accountability is also important for the believer. So many people want to know God. They want to read the word, but they don't want to be in fellowship with others. You know, um, I came to Christ when I was 19 years old. 
Um, I, I grew up in the church. We went to church with my mom, all of those things, all the way through high school, all of that. But I never knew Christ for myself. And it wasn't until I was in college. I, had, I was a student athlete um, at the University of South Florida. I had a track, I had a track scholarship to, to be a thrower there. And so I, when I got there, um, the other throwers, I got to meet them. And one of the throwers, um, I had been following her for years because she's like the best in the state, uh, Misty Barber. And she was like the ch ch shot put champion like for four years in a row. It was ridiculous. And she still holds this shot put record in the state of Florida to this day. And so I was so excited to be her teammate. But what I did not know about Misty is that she was a believer and uh, she was the daughter of a pastor. And, um, but she really believed, she really believed. <laughs> And Misty spent all her days, you know, every word out of Misty's mouth is praise God, and I'm grateful to God for this, I'm grateful to God for that. And we're like, what is this? <laughs> you know, we only hear that from older people or whatever, but here was Misty, this 18-year-old, you know, completely on fire for God. And Misty was, was prepared to be the basically the evangelist for the track and field team right every day she was just like asking people about God sharing something you know God said this to me about you and all that and so of course Misty was annoying and so <laughs> bless her and Misty um, very much was like okay we're teammates I'm so glad we're teammates all this stuff the most humble person you've ever met I mean she's this superstar across the state even nationally, but she, her life was Jesus, and so Misty every day would, every weekend, she'd go, you know, are you coming to church? Do you want to come to church with me? You should come to church with me, and I'm like, Misty, I am, I'll be at the clubs on Saturday night. I will not be in church. I, I will be hung over, all those things, and so she pressed me for about a good year. I had fun for a whole year, and Misty, asked me one more time, you know, you do want to come to church with me? It's just a regular thing. She didn't, she didn't take rejection at all. And so, so I went to church with Misty, and for the first time in my life, I heard the gospel. I heard it. And my poor pastor that, you know, pretty much raised us in, in his church would probably be like, I spoke the gospel <laughs> several times. And here you are. Okay, now you need to hear it from some stranger. All right. But so I finally heard the gospel. I realized that I am a sinner that needs salvation. And so I heard the gospel. I became saved. I was a snotty mess on the floor. I couldn't, you know, couldn't get myself together, all that. But following that, Misty was so excited, right? Because she's gained one <laughs> for the kingdom. And Misty uh, was like, okay, great. This is wonderful. We need to get together, you know, all this stuff. And so she goes, we need to be accountability partners. And I was like, what is an accountability partner? <laughs> you know, and Misty was like, well, well, we'll just, we're walking together in Christ, you know, and I'll be your sister and we're sisters anyway and all this stuff. So I said, okay, fine. And so me and Misty and then the, another individual that, um, that also fell for Misty's trap, she came to church and she also became safe. And so me and Misty and Latoya, we were in this, we basically had a covenant with each other. We said, we're going to be accountability partners. I had no clue what I was getting into. It was such a rocky time. <laughs> Because here we are, we love each other, we, we do track and field, um, so we're, we're pro I don't know, we had like two a days, three a days, sometimes, you know, we're working out three times a day, we're in classes together because they put us in classes together so we can not fail, um, and so we spent all day together every single day, and we'd spend time praying together, we'd read the word together, and it was all wonderful until you don't want somebody telling you your business, right? And so obviously in our prayer, we'd be confessing to each other, oh, you know, I'm struggling with this, I'm struggling with that, pray for this and that and all that. But here's the interesting thing about accountability partners is that they keep you accountable. <laughs> Like, you've made a commitment to Christ. I'm here to hold you accountable to your commitment. And we spent so much time being accountable to each other. I think we had about a good year together. And God used those ladies to perfect me, 
to cause me to come to him, to be in his face, to seek the word. A lot of times we're going to read and study the word, really just so that we can give each other a word (laughs) and talk, talk about that. But it gave us an opportunity to learn God's word. It gave us an opportunity to dig deeper and to, to, to have a stronger relationship with God. And through that, we were able to, to grow up in Christ and, and able to let go of a lot of the sin in our lives because, one, we didn't want the other person to know. <laughs> but more importantly, we wanted to see God. And so through that relationship, we found ourselves letting go of a lot of bitterness and unforgiveness and, and not falling in traps of, you know, the fleshly ways. You know, I, there were some beautiful men in that time. <laughs> They were, you know, the football team, the basketball team, the soccer team. They were gorgeous. They're wonderful, and you know, we're all we all spend time in the same environment. So it was just like it was like, you know, it was wonderful. And so we struggled a lot with that, right? Here we are. We're young. You know, we're we're energetic. We're beautiful. We we're doing things and. We have desires. We want to be. We want to be in relationship with these guys. They want to be in relationship with us, and we had to struggle with that. And so that was one of those like, you know, we are constantly like, "Where are you? Who are you with? <laughs> you shouldn't be there." You know, we constantly had to keep each other accountable, and it, it got on our nerves. So we had this love hate relationship. It was rough. It was painful, but it was powerful, and it, it it changed our lives. It kept us. It helped us continue in Christ and it built our relationship with God and with each other and to the point that we started doing ministry together. We started our, our Fellowship of Christian Athletes um, branch at University of South Florida. We started sharing the gospel with others and wouldn't you know once we were finally in a groove God was like I'm gonna break this thing up right and um, we all basically were called to, to move away from from Tampa and this was right around the time where we were sharing the gospel with our coach. And he came to Christ, which is awesome. He came to Christ. God used us to share the gospel, and he saw our lives too. But he, we came to, he came to Christ, and we told him, hey, we, we don't feel like this is where God wants us anymore. And he was like, you know, that's okay, because God was also calling him away. And he's now like the... He's the track and field coach for um, Southern Wesleyan University in like South um, South Carolina or North Carolina, somewhere in the Carolinas. And um, and then we all went our different ways. I came here to Gainesville. I started to do prison ministry. Misty um, end up back at her pa- father's um, church, and she's now leading her own church. And other indiv- uh, and Latoya is doing some things as well. But through that accountability, that that was necessary for us to learn God's voice. And we had to hear it in each other. We had to hear it in the Bible. We had to hear it in the, in the ways um, that God was revealing himself to us. So I really encourage you, if, uh, if you're looking for accountability, <laughs> somebody to hold you accountable, ask God to show you who, who that person could be and, and don't be afraid to ask like Misty, Misty did. Just be forewarned. It's a hard journey. Somebody in your business. So I... And Paul said, so Paul said at the end of of, of, um, verse 12, he said that I would, that they were even cut off, which trouble you. These are really strong words about excommunication. And and this, this, it tells us just how dangerous these doctrines are and these false teachings are to our faith. And so Paul is saying that the doctrines um, like these being spread among the believers should be treated like leaven and they should be removed. And you should excommunicate those individuals. You should stay away from them. You should tell them to go. And so we we have to take seriously these fallacies that are being shared, these false teachings that are being shared. So Paul tells us to stand fast. I think that was one of the words in one of the um, the songs to to hold on and don't let go of the liberty where where Christ has made us free. Um, Romans six eighteen tells us that being being then made free from sin you became servants of righteousness. So now he tells us to not let that freedom be an opportunity to sin. And we see that in the next couple of verses here, um, um, Galatians 13 to 26. And he says, For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. 
only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one another. This I say then, walk in the spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the l- flesh lusts against the f- spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led by, by the spirit, you are not under the law. Led of the spirit. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, and which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, uh, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, uh, murders, drunkenness, revilings, and such, of which I tell you before, and as I have told you in time past, that they which do these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the afflictions and lust. And if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So the flesh refers to God's original creation, which is now mortal and in decay because of sin entering the world through Adam. And this is the state that we are in before coming to Christ through the salvation of the cross and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And after receiving Christ's justification by faith, there are two ways to live. Either you live according to the flesh by satisfying its desires, or you live according to the Spirit of God in a manner that reflects God's character that is living in us. Romans 8.13 tells us, if we live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you live by the, if by the Spirit you put to death the very deeds of the body, you will live. Paul lists all of those characteristics of the flesh in 19 through 21. It's powerful and it's serious enough that Paul tells us that if we continue to do these things, we will not inherit the kingdom of God. Why? Are we saved no matter what mistake we make? Yes. But what... What are we saved from if we continue to live in the sin? There is a difference in making a mistake and, and then living in sin and hoping that God just has grace, his grace covers you. We shouldn't grieve the spirit of God by living in sin. We essentially reject God, his truth, and his spirit, um, essentially his love, if we continue living in sin because we don't, we haven't truly repented. And repentance, we know that that means to turn and forsake the very thing that we repented about. And so t- this means that we don't have, it doesn't mean that we don't have struggles, but we have to trust God with our struggles. We have to give it to him in prayer and to desire to live according to the way that he wants us to live. So it's important that we, we take the time to allow the Holy Spirit to work in us, both to do, to will, and to do of his good pleasure, as as Philippians tells us. This process is often called sanctification. So we we are saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. So justification is that we are, we are saved, which Christ, which Paul has already laid out that we are justified by great, by, um, by faith. And then being saved is the sanctification that Galatians is talking about here. And that is an ongoing process that God works in us, a continual process to, to die and let those things of the world, the sin, the flesh, die away from us. And then the we will be saved is the glorification, when our bodies will be saved from the very presence of sin. That's usually when we die or if Jesus comes back today. So God guides us in sanctification. However, when when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide us into all truth. He will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. He will tell you things to come. You know, during that time of being with Misty and um, Latoya as my accountability partner, spending a lot of time in prayer, spending a lot of time in the word of God, I had to bring 
the things that I was struggling with to God. And um, oftentimes, um, I would try to, you know, go just, God, just somehow just take this thing away. And the thing about it is our flesh has desires and, and um, its own will, basically. And just praying, God, take that thing away. I don't want to do that anymore. The Holy Spirit takes the time to take what we give to him and reveal to us some of the sources and the, the deep roots of, of our desires. And so for me, one of those was very much, you know, the beautiful, handsome men that were on the campus. And, um, and I had to give that to God because I'm like, God, I, w- I, I desire to do your will. I want to do it. But this, this thing just keeps feeling like I want to I wanna be with this. I want to do those things. I want to be like all the other college kids. And um, I had to bring that to God. And it, it's one thing to go, okay, well, I just, won't, I just won't have a boyfriend. That's fine. But even if you don't do that, you still have those desires. You still want to be with someone. You still have um, a desire to, for companionship and those things. And, and just trying to understand, where does this come from? Why do I keep feeling this way? Why does it feel like such a priority? And, I, and the Holy Spirit had to teach me and through looking at my environment and the things around me. And so for me, you know, I grew up loving music, all kinds of music. We had every kind of genre. And so I had this stack of CDs. And it's like after I prayed, it was like everything in me just felt like, I need to go look at this list, <laughs> this 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 thing, this uh, list of, of CDs and uh, music. And God started to reveal, hey, some of these, some of this music is what's feeding you those, those fleshly desires. And so I slowly started going, okay, I'd listen to the songs and I'd listen to it and I would see how it responds to me and God would reveal it. God, God would show me how I respond to it and I'm like, okay, so this is not your will, all right. So that CD's gone, that CD's gone. And it got down to one CD and I was like, God, this has to stay. <laughs> this, is, this is Stevie Wonder. <laughs> I can't let go of Stevie. He's great. He's fantastic. The music's wonderful. And I had, to, and God had to reveal to me that with music, you know, because if you, if you study Isaiah, he talks about um, Lucifer and uh, how he became Satan. And, and Lucifer was basically, um, God created him with music in his body, right? And so he would play music out of his body and that's how worship was was happening in heaven and so I had to go oh okay so music and Satan are synonymous so I had to really take the time to to study that and so God led me through that study and I got to the place where I basically went okay so music has three purposes it glorifies God it glorifies your flesh or it glorifies Satan and so through that Every single song, every single artist, I had to kind of filter out and go, oh, well, what are, they, what are they singing about? What are they really, what is the root of this? And how is that affecting me and affecting my walk with Christ? And so Stevie had to go. <laughs> and so eventually I, I had to get to a place where all I listened to was music that glorified God. Why? Because that's my goal. That's my, that's my, that's where I'm trying to go. That's my vision. And so and that's what God wants me to go to. That's his will. That's his desire for me to love him with my heart, soul, mind, body, everything. And so he led me that way. And I had to surrender that area. And so when you trust God and you seek his word and you, you allow his spirit to guide you, he will, he will help you get rid of those things of the flesh. And so, oh, we're running out of time. Um, so... I want to get to the last point that that Paul wanted to make to the Galatians, which is um, Galatians 6, 1 through 10. Being free by bearing one another's burdens. So Galatians 6 um, said, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall 
he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teaches in all good things. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have opportunity, therefore, let us do good unto all men, especially unto those which are of the household of faith. So at Grace, we have, you know, our motto, we love God and love people. So as we live in the spirit and not our flesh, we are loving the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, and soul. And Paul reminds us that loving one another as we, can, we love ourselves, we, might, we must be free to lovingly restore one another when someone falls into temptation. We should treat them how we would want to be treated in the same situation with compassion and godly love. Paul brings it back to us that we are free to bear one another's burdens when we sow in the spirit, not in our flesh. See, when you're caught up in your own flesh, you don't have space and energy and ability to care about another. Our flesh reaps death, death, but the spirit gives us life and life more abundantly. Again, this freedom to bear one another's burden doesn't mean that we want to continue in their sin we want them to continue in their sin and like in misty and um latoya we would constantly push one another we want to bear one another's burden because we want to live a life that is pleasing to god and we want our sister to live a life that's pleasing to god it means that we lovingly point them to god and encourage them to live in the spirit and to go on and not sin anymore by putting their trust in god So can a Christian lead a sinless life? Well, Wesley taught us that mature Christians will always be capable of falling into sin, but they they do not need to necessarily do so. Christians are free from the dominion of sin, the power of sin, and can choose to not do it or choose against it. But we live in a fallen world dominated by sin and its effects. We will have to wait for the total deliverance from the presence of sin that is that glorification until the life uh, until until the life to come so wesley admitted that there is always room for for a christian um, to develop in maturity but we but he believed that christians can only can enjoy a greater degree of freedom from sin than uh, reformed theologians thought possible so he went as far as to assert that christians can be delivered from willful sin that is this level of sanctification can occur before death for this reason wesley often said that christians should not be content with any religion which does not imply the destruction of all works of the devil that is of all sin we can fulfill god's law law of love in this life despite all the failings and imperfections of the world. This is what Wesley calls optimism of grace. So today I just want to remind us, as Paul um, has done, that we are called to sanctification, that we should be different from the world. We should be, there should be a distinction in the way that we live, in the way that we move, in the way we talk, the things that we do. We shouldn't look like the world. We shouldn't, we shouldn't behave like the world because Christ has freed us. And if you are struggling and not, not knowing where to begin, you know, if you're not sure if you have the Holy Spirit, you know, Jesus said in Luke 11, 13, that if ye men, then being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? And if you have been living in, fle- in the flesh and God has convicted your heart today, um, I want you to come and c- confess it to God. Ask God to give you his Holy Spirit so he can guide you to living free in his spirit. If you're not currently uh, connected to people so that you have accountability, so that you have support as you walk this life, if you're not connected to a life group or Bible studies, um, I encourage you to do it. Um, it, it 
it changes your walk tremendously, having that support system, having individuals that can be able to be willing to say, hey, brother, that is not what God has called you to. That changes everything. And as the Galatians, um, same as Paul has spoken to the Galatians today, I hope that we will walk in the freedom, stand fast in the liberty that Christ has made us free and not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage, but continue to walk in the spirit of God. So that's all I have for you today <laughs> as I'm being ushered out here. And so um, I just want to say that the altar is always open. If you want someone to pray with you, we, we have many people here. Um, and so we're going to go to God in prayer and thank him for our word. Amen. Father God, Lord, we just thank you. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for faith um, that justifies us, God. We thank you, Lord, that you have made it possible for us to have freedom, to have liberty in Christ Jesus. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your sacrifice, for your life for your death, for your resurrection, that we may have life and have it more abundantly today. God, we don't want to take it for granted, the work that you've done in our lives. We don't want to, to say that we are associated with you, but not walk by your spirit and not honor you by, by walking in the way that you walk. You came to this earth and you lived a sinless life so that we can live in that power too, God. And Lord, we thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the spirit of truth that will lead us into all truth, that will guide us to walk according to your will, God, and that will give us that very will, that drive to live the life that you have for us to live, God. Lord, we give our, our, our sins to you. We give you the things that we are struggling with, God. We give to you our depressions, our anxieties, God, our, our fornications, our adultery, our, 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 our bitterness, God. We give it to you. We ask you, God, that you would empower us by your spirit to live a life that is pleasing to you, a life that is free, a life that is not bound, God, that we can be servants of righteousness and not servants of sin, God. And we pray, Lord, that you will do your work in us here, that we, others may know that you are real, that your word is true, that your spirit has power, God. And Lord, we walk in your presence, God. We glorify you. We worship you here today, God, because you are faithful, you are true, and you are good. We honor you, Lord, and we thank you for all that you're doing in us. In Jesus' name. Can we just join together and, uh, and give Linda a hand? Well, we're going to sing this last song together, so I invite you to stand. Just sing how holy he is. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one No 
Have a seat, Grace Church. 
Linda, thank you so much for that today. That, that was wonderful. Um, if you are new to Grace, if you're online, if you've been around Grace for a long time, um, we've got some great groups that are meeting over the summer. And, and there's three things that really you can take away from as part of Linda's message. Um, one is that being in community with others will allow you to dive into scripture, which is the most important thing. Um, number two, you can have those accountability partners, and we have that option for you here at Grace. And three, walking with others, having that fellowship, it really does change your life. So with that said, I wanted to highlight three groups that are meeting and active this summer. Um, the Crafty Ladies are meeting, they share fellowship, they make crafts, they share meals, um, and they create things to go support our ministries, um, ministries locally and abroad. They meet on Thursdays at 10 a.m. and in the fellowship hall and mary miller leads that group if you want more information about that just email the front office and we will get you connected with mary men um, the men's breakfast is going on uh, throughout the summer those those meetings will occur regularly on fridays at 8 a.m at patty cakes patty cakes in tioga um, just down the road from here tom robertson is leading that group and as you can see on the screen there's an email address men at gracegmv.org um, they also want to coordinate some special men's retreats, camping. Um, this is a great way for husbands, fathers, sons, mentors to really walk with each other and develop. I'd encourage you men in the room, invite another man, go to this breakfast, grab a coffee. Nothing can, bad can come of this. And last but not least, the Sojourners, it's a group that's applying God's word to everyday circumstances to enrich our walk with God. They meet Sundays at 9.30 to 10.30 right after the 8 a.m. service. This lovely group also has a Zoom option available for anyone you know who's not comfortable being in a group setting here at, at church. And Claudia Lambert leads that group. Her email's on the screen. Um, reach out to them. Anyone else? There's also a few other groups that are meeting um, outside this, the walls of the fellowship hall. You'll see on the right-hand side some handouts. Grab one on your way out. See if there's a way you can plug in. If you're already plugged in, thank you. Encourage someone else to join you. Thank you so much. in the liberty where Christ has made you free and be not tangled entangled again with the yoke of bondage go and live in the spirit amen <laughs>